Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Eun Siu Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church. It is my great joy to welcome you to our worship service at The Vine, an online campus of Riceville United Methodist Church. We are so grateful to worship together, especially on the last day of this year, 2023. No matter where you're joining us from, we cherish your presence with us. So it is our prayer that through today's worship service, you will encounter God in a meaningful way and receive a blessing that touches your heart and life. So now let us open your hearts and minds to experience God's love and grace. Take a deep breath and feel closer to our Lord. Let us go before God in opening prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we come to shout and rejoice in the wonderful gift of your Son for our world. It is a miracle that fills our lives with your glory. On this last day of the year, may our celebration honor the good we have received from your hand even as we look forward to walking faithfully with you in the year ahead. As those who came before us, we will not be silent in our love for you. We will not mute our pure joy for what you have brought to our lives. In your holy name, Amen. Let us reaffirm our faith through the Apostle Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence, he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. has broken like the first morning blackbird has spoken like the first bird praise for the singing praise for the morning praise for them springing fresh from the world sweet the rain's new sunlight from heaven like the first dew fall on the first grass praise for the sweetness of the wet garden sprung in completeness where his feet pass mine is the sun Mine is the morning, born of the one life, eaten salt play. Praise with elation, praise every morning, God's recreation of the new day. Please join me as we pray together. Holy and loving God, we bow before you on this day 
to praise the coming of your presence among us. You are a gift of sustenance to souls who hunger and thirst. You are balm to the wounded. You are the light to shine in the darkness. We rejoice at your coming as we worship together. Thank you, Lord, for your mercies that have kept us all through this year, even amidst the storms and challenges we have faced. So many have happened to us and around us, but here we are on the last day saying thank you, God, because you have proven yourself faithful. We are grateful for your grace. God of new beginnings, as a new year dawns, begin again with us. We thank you that you are still Emmanuel, God with us. Heal our wounded spirit. Reopen our heart to hope. Help us to overcome the fears that keep us from fullness of life. As we face a new year, bring us to new places of openness and love toward you and the people around us. And help us to become signs of your compassion, hope, peace, and love. Gracious God, we desire your healing mercies in our lives and in the lives of friends and family. Those who are lost and alone, who suffer from illnesses, who mourn, who feel hopeless, are in our hearts this day. So now we pray for these whom we name with our voices or in our hearts. Lord, in your never-ending mercy, in your great goodness, hear our prayers. Let your light shine on them, bringing healing and comfort. Help us to be bearers of that light in all that we do and in all that we say. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take a moment to offer our heart and gift. As we respond to God's grace and generosity, I'd like to remind you that you can contribute to the ministry of Ricefield United Methodist Church through our smartphone app, website, and via mail. Let us continue to worship our God. Now it's time for the children's sermon. And if you've got kids or youth nearby who aren't already watching this video, now's a great time to call them over. I've got something special to share with them today. Hey guys, I'm Pastor David, one of your associate pastors. And I get to share with you the children's sermon today. And um, I'm actually gonna share with you a book that I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, this, this Sunday, we're still in the Christmas season. Now, Christmas Day, of course, was last Monday, but we're in the Christmas season. Anybody know for how long? That's right, 12 days. We even sing a song about that, the 12 days of Christmas. 
And so we're still thinking about Christmas because it's such an important day. And I, what I'd like for us to do today, I want to share with you this book, Twas the Evening of Christmas. And it tells the Christmas story, what happened on that night. It tells it in a little bit different way. And it starts out, "'Twas the evening of Christmas, when all through the town, every inn was so crowded, no room could be found. Tired Mary and Joseph, who went door to door, at last found a place on a small stable floor." And here you can see the picture of Mary and Joseph. "'Thank goodness,' said Mary, who tiptoed inside, the mice saw the donkey and scurried to hide. The rest of the creatures all cuddled up tight in hopes that they might have a calm, peaceful night. The pigeons were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of breadcrumbs danced around their heads. The cows closed their eyes and the oxen laid down. The doves cooed so gently the lambs made no sound. You can see the, the pigeons and the cows and the sheep there. The moon through the trees was just starting to glow with a glimmer of light on the stable below when quite by surprise came a newborn babe's cry that woke all the animals sleeping nearby. Up jumped the cows and the oxen and sheep. Up popped the pigeons, aroused from their sleep. They all came to gaze at the small baby boy as his mama and papa hugged him with joy. Now donkeys, now cows, now pigeons and sheep, now oxen and mice in the manger did peep. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples so sweet, as they nuzzled his fingers and cute little feet. And out in the fields, taking care of their sheep, some shepherds were just getting ready to sleep, when all of a sudden they had such a fright as a whole choir of angels lit up the night. Here you can see the shepherds and the angels up in the sky. But the song of the angels, the words that they said, soon let the men know they had nothing to dread. Dear shepherds, it's wonderful news that we bring. A Savior is born. He is Jesus the King. They ran to the stable and peeked through the door and saw something never imagined before. There in a manger a baby boy lay, no blankets, no pillow, his bed made of hay. And to that small stable came three splendid kings with gifts for their baby, all beautiful things. They jumped from their camels and knelt at his feet with their frankincense, gold, and myrrh that smelled sweet. Here you can see the three kings, the three wise men that came. The stable was filled with a wonderful light as stars above Bethlehem twinkle so bright. And high in the heavens, God whispered, My son, you'll bring hope to the world and love everyone. Then back to their slumbers, the animals curled, amazed at this babe who had entered their world. As Mary and Joseph got ready for bed, they snuggled their baby and kissed his sweet head. As Mary laid Jesus asleep in the hay, she thought about all that had happened that day. The mice heard her whisper as she tucked him in tight, Merry Christmas, my son, and to all a good night. So yeah, we celebrate Christmas for 12 days. So we're still thinking about Christmas, even though maybe some of the decorations are gone and the presents have all been opened and some of the toys have already been broken. 
but we're still thinking about Christmas because it's God's wonderful gift to the world. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God sent Jesus to be our Savior and our Lord. And that's the real meaning of Christmas. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank You that as we celebrate Christmas, we're celebrating the birth of our Savior, the greatest gift ever given, the first and best Christmas present ever given, the gift that You gave to the world. We thank You also, Lord, for all of the children and youth of our church and community and their parents and families. We pray Your blessings on them. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our scripture reading for uh, today's service comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And this is the familiar story of the wise men, or the Magi, coming to visit the baby Jesus. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star in the east and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen in the east, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the Word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our midst that our hearts might be prepared to hear your Word. May your anointing be upon the one who preaches that his sins and shortcomings though they be many, might not hinder your word. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Well, you thought Christmas was over, right? But no, not yet. As I explained earlier in the children's message, uh, we still have a few more days for celebrating Christmas. Uh, next Saturday, in fact, will be, uh, that's uh, January 6th, will be the Church Holy Day of Epiphany which is traditionally celebrated as the day that the wise men came to visit Jesus. And then after that, we enter into the season of Epiphany. And speaking of the wise men, do you know why they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh to the baby Jesus? Well, obviously, uh, they didn't bother to check Mary's Amazon wish list. 
right? Yeah. And, and do you know why the three wise men were late? Well, because even back then, men wouldn't stop to ask for directions. Well, the three wise men that are also called Magi uh, were probably from Persia, which is far to the east of Palestine. And they may have left on their journey as much as one or two years prior to the birth of Jesus. Uh, we don't know a lot about them. They were not Christians. It's not likely that they were Jewish either. Traditionally, one, in fact, was a dark-skinned man, uh, perhaps of African descent. We don't know how many there were. We know they brought these three kinds of gifts, but we're never told exactly how many of these wise men there were. There were at least two because they're referred to as the wise men, not the wise man. One of the things that we learn from the wise men is that smart people can follow Jesus. Smart people can be Christians. Uh, I re came across recently a, an internet post from an atheist, and he says, if you have the awareness level of a snail and your thinking is mired in shame and guilt, then subscribing to a religion can help you climb to a higher level of awareness. Your mindset, however, still remains incredibly dysfunctional. That's from a guy named uh, Steve Pavlina. Well, there, there are some pretty dumb and superstitious people out there that are Christians, but smart people can be Christians too. You don't have to be superstitious and guilt-ridden to have faith. And the wise men proved it. Notice the story doesn't say, now there came dumb men from the east, or there came stupid men from the east. <laughs> no, smart people can be Christians too. Uh, the United Methodist Church traces its approach to Christianity back to a man named John Wesley who lived in the 1700s. Uh, he was an Anglican priest, the Church of England, uh, similar to our Episcopal Church. Uh, Mr. Wesley was the most brilliant Anglican theologian of the 18th century, the 1700s. He was educated at Oxford University and had a master's degree. He mastered seven languages. He wrote a medical book that was published in more than 30 editions. Altogether, he wrote more than 400 books and publications. He pioneered the use of electric shock to treat nervous disorders. He was brilliant, and he had a deep, deep faith. Smart people can have faith and believe in Jesus. Faith may be irrational at times, but it's never unreasonable. And the wise men are a great example. So when we think about these wise men, what made the wise men so wise? Well, first of all, they were wise enough to know that God was up to something. Now, we don't know if they were familiar with the Jewish scriptures and the many prophecies about the coming Messiah. But we do know that they apparently looked to the heavens for signs of God's activity. And when they saw the Christmas star, they were so impressed that they figured out that a great new king was born. Now, this may sound a little superstitious to us. We don't look to the stars for signs of anything. Well, unless you read your daily horoscope, and I don't recommend it. <laughs> but, but let's focus on the basic assumption of the wise men behind following this star. They assumed that God was up to something. God was doing something in a great and mighty way. And it was heralded by the sudden appearance and later disappearance of the Christian star. They assumed 
that God was up to something. Now, here's a good question for us. Do we ever assume that God is up to something? Do we have any expectation that God is able and willing and even maybe getting ready to do something spectacular? When you come to church on Sunday morning or when you watch this uh, video service on the vine, do you expect God to show up? Do you expect to see a miracle? Do you expect to see a life transformed? Let me tell you something else about John Wesley. He was sitting in a Bible study one night while someone was reading from a commentary on the book of Romans. And he would later report that suddenly he felt his heart strangely warmed and he had the assurance that he did trust Christ and Him alone for salvation. Well, we have pretty much domesticated God. We've made our God to be pretty anemic, pretty disengaged. We act like we can only do what we're able to do with our own strength and resources. Sometimes our understanding and expectation of God actually bears little resemblance to the God of the Bible. We don't really expect God to be up to anything. Now, of course, we still ask God for help in finding a parking place, and we get really upset when something happens that we don't like. And we get angry with God because God let something happen that we didn't want. Really? <laughs> the wise men were pretty wise. They had enough sense to recognize that something big was happening. And they believed it was possible that God was behind it and that God, in fact, was up to something. So that's one reason why the wise men were wise. They're also wise because they had faith that God will lead us if we are willing to follow. Now imagine one of the wise men coming home one day, having a conversation with his wife. Hi, honey, I'm home. <laughs> By the way, I'm leaving tomorrow on a trip. And his wife says, okay, where are you going? And he says, well, I don't know exactly. And his wife replies, what do you mean you don't know where you're going? And he says, I'm going to follow a star. And I may, be, I may not be back for several years. And his wife answers, follow a star what are you trying to be, a wise guy? This isn't one of those midlife crises, is it? Oh, no, 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 he says. We believe God has placed this star in the skies for a purpose, perhaps to tell us of the birth of a great king. Well, all right, dear, but before you go, could you take out the trash? <laughs> well, do you think they knew where they were going? Of course not. Those wise men, those magi, set out on a journey to follow the star with no idea where they were going. They seemed to know that if they went far enough west, they would come to the land of the Jews. But they had no idea as to their specific destination. If they had known they wouldn't have stopped in Jerusalem to ask King Herod for directions. They were heading off into the unknown, toward an uncertain destination, on a journey that may have lasted one or two years. Our faith isn't usually strong enough for that kind of commitment. We want church to last no more than one hour. <laughs> Often, we, we even have difficulty doing two or more things for Jesus on Sunday. And even in our church life, we plan our church budget and church activities for no more than one year at a time. We are hesitant to commit to anything 
long term. But the wise men headed off by faith, following God's leading. Isn't that what God is calling us to do? And who knows where God might lead us? Our challenge is to put our faith in God and to follow His leading. And then there's one other indication that we have in this scripture as to why the wise men were wise. They were wise because when they came face to face with Jesus, God led them down a different road and they went. God led them down a different road and they went. Too often, our faith ends up being defined by our secular values and even by our politics. Now, we don't mind a faith that delivers us from hell, you know, a kind of a spiritual fire insurance. But we really don't want a faith that interferes with our plans or our beliefs or preconceived ideas. We don't want a faith that transforms us because that might require us to change or to go a different way in life. If there's a catch to following Jesus, this is it. After the wise men saw Jesus, they couldn't go home the same way. They were led by God in a dream to go down a different road. If you are serious about following Christ, you may also be led down a different road. For example, I'm quite certain that my good friend Chuck Colson had no idea where his life would lead when he committed his life to Christ back in 1971. During the first term of President Richard Nixon, Chuck had the office next to the president's office in the White House. He was a special counsel to President Nixon. Well, uh, after he committed his life to Christ, he ended up leaving the uh, Nixon administration, leaving the White House, and going to prison. And then when he got out of prison, he began a prison ministry. He served time for a Watergate-related offense. God called him down a different road. Now, what road might God lead you down? Uh, maybe not so drastic as prison. <laughs> we hope not. But maybe God will lead you to change some attitudes and lead you down a different road. My understanding of my calling and the direction of my life as a young man was to be a pastor. But then for almost nine years back in the 1980s and early 1990s, God called me to go down a different road for a while and work with Chuck Colson. Uh, I guess after working with people in prison for those years, I guess God decided I was finally ready to work with church people. If you have the faith of the wise men, what different road might God lead you down? Maybe your plan was to kick back and enjoy retirement. God may lead you down a different road. God might lead you to be really busy serving Him. Maybe God will lead you to be a positive influence in a young person's life. Maybe God will lead you to rub shoulders with people of a different skin color in order to be a witness. Maybe God will lead you to go on a mission trip. Or, or what? Only God knows. But I promise you, the life of faith need not be dull. Coming face to face with Christ may lead us down a different road. Do you recognize the name of Mitsuo Fujita? Well, if you've ever seen uh, one of the World War II movies about uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, and also Midway, you should know that name. He was a Japanese Navy command pilot who led the first wave of attacks on Pearl Harbor. But after the end of World War II, 
Fuchida became a Christian. God led him down a different road. And he actually became a Christian evangelist. And he traveled around Europe and North America and Asia sharing his testimony and how Jesus had changed his life. If you are truly committed to follow Jesus, what road might God lead you down? Well, these wise men, these magi were smart, but they didn't let their brains get in the way of faith. They fully believed that God was capable of doing something. They followed where God led, even when God led them down a different road. The great Anglican bishop J.C. Ryle said of these wise men, We read of no greater faith than this in all the Bible. The wise men saw a newborn babe on the lap of a poor woman, and yet they worshipped him and confessed that he was the Christ. My prayer for us is that we will be a church of wise men and women, boys and girls, believing that God is capable, following where God leads, even if God leads us down a different road. 2,000 years ago, Jesus was born. And now, tomorrow, January 1st, is the first day of a new year, 2024. So what's this new year going to be like for you? Will you decide to be a committed follower of Jesus? Yeah, smart people can believe in Jesus. Smart people can have faith. Are you willing to have faith? The faith of the wise men, believing that God is up to something, following where God leads, and following even when God leads down a different road. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the witness and testimony and story and example of the wise men. Help us, O oh Lord, to be willing to follow you. Help us to know that you are capable of being up to something and help us to follow you even when you lead us down a different road. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. And as we go forth into this new year, May God go with us. May God's blessing go with us. The blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.